Yeah, I mean, I mean, well, they've actually signed people. Um, yeah, I even asked them. Like, they've got no one. So, so again, tomorrow. what we are looking at now is, of course, the newly built, sort of lovely building with lots of restaurants. It's very posh, very fancy. How lovely! <laughs> And it was very posh around these parts in the 1800s too. Not much has changed. George Street was always very wealthy. Is still always still very wealthy indeed. Now, what is now the refinery is number four St Andrew's Square. And number four St Andrew's Square was once owned by a man came, called John Gordon. Quite an interesting figure. And I'll be honest with you, I only just found out about him. This, I think, speaks volumes to uh, something very deep about Edinburgh's ties to, and particularly the new town's ties, to the slave trade. So as I said, I wanted to start the tour at the Burns Monument. I wanted to talk about Rabbi Burns in a little more depth, but I will come back to him. I've reordered it, don't worry. And I wanted to go to a house on Regent's Road, which was registered to a slave owner called Alan McDowell. However, with the change of plan, I thought I'm going to need to find a new house. Within literally five minutes, I found this house. <laughs> the man, John Gordon, quite an interesting character. As far as we can tell, had no aristocratic ties, no nobility, and had a very wealthy uncle. Always helpful, I wish I had a very wealthy uncle, to leave me, in modern equivalents, millions and millions of pounds in estates. So he was doing quite well. He himself was a soldier. He fought in the Aberdeen Foot Soldier Regiment, and he went on to become a colonel. That was his official title. By the time of his death in 1859, he allegedly had three million pounds, which we've looked at, you can look into his estates, he did not have three million pounds, he had 250,000, but he was known as the richest commoner in Scotland. Many of his assets are hard to trace, but ones that are not were plantations. In 1834, just one year after abolition, in the British Empire specifically, he received over 12, I have the exact figure actually, why not use it? 12,482 pounds, millions and tens of millions of pounds in modern money across his four estates for 230 slaves. Already you see how slaves are considered. So that is where a great bulk of his money came from. This money came back to him. But first, I would like to do a little bit of context. What is compensation? Why are people getting money for slaves? That's surely not how abolition worked. That makes no sense. Abolition represents freedom, doesn't it? It's more complicated. So we'll go right back to essentially the beginning of Scotland's role and involvement within the colonies, within empire and imperialism. And it was actually before 1707, the Act of Union, before the British Empire was a thing or a concept. The year is 1698. Picture a group of men, obviously men. Picture a group of men <laughs> sat around a table. They are all incredibly wealthy. Between them, they have managed to bring together about a quarter of Scotland's national wealth. They have literally put it in one chest, eggs in one basket, and they are sending it over to a new colony. Somewhere that is going to mark a new Scotland. The capital will be called New Edinburgh. This is what's going to bring Scotland into the modern era. This is what's going to make Scotland rich, like Spain, like France, like England. We can be just like them, we thought. And of course, you would have assumed they would have discussed options. Where is it best to send people like us? You would think maybe Canada, New Zealand, perhaps even the northern parts of what is now the United States of America. But no, they decided they would pick Panama, South America, <laughs> modern day Panama, South America which is, of course, not very conducive to the Scottish skin. And we didn't fare very well with tropical diseases either. So 1698, we send over a quarter of our national wealth, several thousand people, and they go over to start this new colony, which is going to be a trading colony, as you'll find it in textbooks. The things they were going to be trading were humans, slaves taken from Africa. This is going to be quite tough throughout the tour. They become statistics. These were real human beings. Every single person we talk about was somebody who was enslaved from their homes, taken and forced into a life of servitude. So it becomes very difficult, but I want that to be remembered throughout the tour. But yes, these were the commodities that were going to be traded and sugar and tobacco were going to be produced. So, does it go well? Of course it doesn't. Again, as I say, Scottish people, they struggle with the heat. They caught tropical diseases and for some reason the locals didn't like them just coming in and trying to take their land. They were very annoyed by it. Within two years, 1700, the scheme had completely failed. And that national debt was incurred 
25% of our national wealth was wiped off. It was one of the key reasons that aristocrats remember democracy was not in the same way it is today, where you feel at least like you have a vote. At that time, it was just rich white men making decisions for everyone. But the decision they made was to sign up to the Act of Union in 1707, and one of the key perks was that national debt became absorbed into the debt of the United Kingdom. And in return, the English got our lovely coastlines, which was very, very good for this trade. So that is the beginning of our involvement. And involved, boy, we get it. Very quickly, traders realised that there's no point in setting up their own ports. They already exist in Liverpool, in Bristol, and in Whitehaven. So they go to them. If you go to Liverpool, London, or Whitehaven, you will find huge links to Scottish people. Lots of Scottish names, lots of Scottish ties, and it's because of the huge presence that Scottish slave owners and slave traders had in these cities. What we did see coming into Scotland was the products of that trade. Into the Leith docks, which you can't really see, but we'll be able to see when we're up on the mound, as long as it's still nice and clear, fingers crossed it is Scotland. Into Leith docks came tobacco, came sugar. We, uh, we brought in as much as we physically could. This may not have looked like the slave trade, however, it absolutely was. And eventually, eventually, this would come to an end. In 1833, it was decided and voted that no longer slavery should be legal and no longer should it be the case that people in the British Empire can own slaves. It was not easy as it was made out to be in Scotland. It was not a unanimous concept. Dundas, we'll go back to him. There he is, stood atop his monument, living a great life without any criticism. Dundas, known as the unofficial King of Scotland, an incredibly wealthy man and MP, in, in 1792 gave an exceptional speech, as it was noted, against abolition, believing it would be far too detrimental to the British Empire and the good, honest people of the British Empire. He was supported in large by Glasgow merchants. He was applauded in London when he gave his speech. He was an MP here. He represented us. Again, democracy was not the same as it was, but he stands there still today, looking down a memory. And he was the same man that defended Knight. That baffles me. It really confuses me, but history is complicated, I suppose. And it wasn't just Dundas. It wasn't just elites either. In England, slavery found anti-abolition uh, anti found support predominantly in London, Liverpool and Bristol. However, in Scotland, we find people anti-abolition in the Highlands, on the West Coast, in Dundee, in Aberdeen, in the Lowlands and in Stirling, all over the country. People did not want to see slavery abolished. Now, when it was, which it was, it didn't take the path that I assumed it would have done. Slavery took the path of compensation. Now, what this means was slaves and people were still property. And in order to give up property, you should receive compensation, was the argument of the slave owners. And indeed, compensation they received. We're back to John Gordon. £12,482 for his four estates and 230 slaves. And one of the claims was actually not given, so he could have made more money. That's one year. £12,482. This is before digital banking. In one year, he receives compensation. Within three years, all compensation is paid out. £20 million in money of that time was paid out to slave owners. Again, before digital banking, it was incredibly orderly. And as part of that compensation, frequently, those who had been enslaved, who are now emancipated, had to give six years of free labour. So their freedom was not exactly given, it was bought, and often with their own labour. It doesn't feel like the celebration that we make it out to be. And our role in it is not as wonderful and as brilliant as we often like to think. And it very much comes across in Scottish history books and textbooks. Now, the reason that I find all of this so shocking, I think that we are not that knowledgeable about it at the moment, it's not on the common tongue, is, and there's one walking tour in Edinburgh so far, and this might be a second. So there's two, there are hundreds of walking tours. I have two guy colleagues on with us today who will tell you there are hundreds of different walking tours for all manner of different things, but not this. And I think it's because we have not addressed it yet as a nation. The first book to actually go into and look at slavery was not published in Scotland until 
the, the, the 2010s. Within the last decade, the first serious academic study has occurred. Little inklings here and there in different books, but in 2001, the Oxford Handbook of Scotland, the great academic Oxford and the great literature that would have come from those Scottish academics contributing, made one reference to slavery in its index. So these things help to contribute to a system where we do not talk about it. And Scots were thoroughly involved. I'm going, to make, uh, I'm going to contribute more to how Scots were involved on a local level and in terms of numbers when we move over to the Walter Scott Monument. So follow me further on. But this man, John Gordon, received lots of money and now it's a refinery. <laughs>